guys, Kevin Mitch here on the Big Head Pod, just sitting down, sitting here thinking about some of the whiskey that we've been been uh, privy to, being a part of the sponsor here on our show, Herman Marshall Whiskey. You guys get a chance to drink this stuff, try it out. The single malt is by far the best one they have. There's four kinds. They have a single malt, they have a blend, they have a bourbon, they have a rye. The order I would go in is a single malt by far. I just found this. Don't ever try and take this from me. I might have to beat you with the bottle. Then the rye, the blend, and then the bourbon. This stuff is phenomenal. Texas made and Texas produced here, guys. This stuff is unbelievable. So if you get a chance to do it, go grab yourself a bottle. This stuff is amazing. Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest is a first for me. She hails from down under, known this young lady, 20 years, and she is an excellent tennis player, but beyond that, she's just an excellent human being, and without further ado, Miss Renee Stubbs. Renee, how Hi, are Kev. we doing today? <laughs> I'm good. I'm how are we doing today, Renee? I'm very well, thanks, Kev. Uh, it's great to be on your uh, your podcast. <laughs> And getting a chance to uh, just to talk talk tennis, talk about growing up, it just in Australia and and that I mean you've made the complete world circuit with 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 tennis and everything else. Um, I want to get just to, back to you know to growing up in Australia was 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 tennis your first love? I mean you know I see when, when people see Australia and they see the beaches, they think surfing, maybe some baseball. What what was your what was your childhood like growing up? Was tennis the love, or was there other things that you wanted to do? Well, there's no question that tennis was probably my first true love. Um, but I, you know, look, growing up in Australia, I think this is so indicative of of being Australian is that we were. And of course, we, I was growing up in a time with no phones, no cell phones, no like, you know, devices. And, and so we were like, get out of the house and go and do whatever. And, you know, I would play cricket with my brother. I play rugby with my brother, you know, touch football with my brother or my sister and, you know, go swimming, go into the ocean. Uh, I swam competitively as a, as a young kid. So I played netball, which, uh, you know, Americans don't really know, but it's very popular in Australia, especially growing up as a, as a, as a girl in Australia. It's kind of like our, our version of softball. You know, it's really quite a popular thing for, for, for girls. So I, I did everything, you know what I mean? I did every sport. I, I played every sport I could. And then by about nine, 10 years of age, I started really focusing a lot more on tennis. And, um, you know, that's where I sort of put my put my energies in as a kid um was was to play tennis but honestly kevin i like all kids i grew up just being obsessed with being outside and playing and doing any sport i could particularly with my with my older brother because you know who doesn't want to be around their older brother doing sports exactly i think that's gone by the wayside in this generation of being outside right you talk about the electronics it was right go outside and the sun comes out sun goes down and then you, you got to come back in and i and i th i think as athletes right we our bodies go through you know different muscle groups different mm -hmm. the even different demographics right and different um i guess visual aspects of the game right from from like you said from from rugby to tennis to to softball or anything else you get to see different different ideas and i think it helps us as athletes right sure. so being that way um so were, so were they both tennis players as well your brother and sister or was that your so that's the competitive juices were there with all that yeah yeah i mean my older brother was really good athlete he played rugby and um tennis um he was a good swimmer my, my brother was kind of like the dude version of me he could do everything um and i was a complete not a tomboy so anytime i could get out and do any sports and my sister was quite a good athlete as well but she she ended up doing sort of equestrian riding um because my my mom's side of the family was you know all horses and they owned a stud farm and my mom was an equestrian rider so my sister sort of be took that route whereas I was more swimming tennis uh just being outside and so that was you know key to me and I, you know I think about now how kids grow up and I'm I I just so I'm almost sad for them because they don't get the opportunity um you know they come home from school and they get on their devices and they don't we used to like you said it was like all right you had to be home at dusk right that was all we were told you know we could ride our bikes around and I know that there's a lot sadly a lot more crazy you know stuff happening in the world and you have to be a little bit more i guess aware of where your kids are but um that in, in and of itself is sad but i think that 
we were just given free reign to do what we wanted as long as we were home to do our schoolwork and home by dark. And that was kind of the key to my childhood. And, and yeah, I think, you know, you do d- different, different sports, you get different dexterities, you use different footwork, you use different muscles. Um, and then also you kind of pick apart what you really want. Right. Um, and mm-hmm. I eventually found tennis to be, I don't want to say easy, but I guess I found that to be the most, the thing that came naturally to me the best. And, and I also loved it. And my brother was quite a good player. So I, I really wanted to be around him and, and our friends. And I had, I had gotten a core group of young friends at that point. Some of them I'm still friends with to this day and I wanted to be with them. And so I went to, I used to go to school before school. I'd play tennis after school. I'd play tennis. I'd ride my bike, you know, I was quite independent. And so that's sort of where my love of tennis ended up taking me to where that I went. was. And so your brother was kind of your motivation to be right. That's, that's what mine was. I want to be better than you at whatever, whatever it was. I'm sure if he yeah. was out doing <laughs> if a rugby or something, you'd have probably t- gone to rugby because you wanted to be better than he was. Yeah. I don't know if I ever wanted to be better because I just knew he was always going to be better than me just being a boy and being older, but I wanted to at least be around him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and my parents also thought, you know, it's all okay to go with her. And my older sister was quite a decent tennis player as well. Um, and she was quite athletic too. And so, but as I said, she ended up going to the equestrian world. But um, to be frank, I think, you know, as, my, as long as my parents knew we were together having fun and doing what we wanted to do, that was the key. So I would stress that to any parent, like make sure your kid's just out there having fun and having passion for what they're doing. Yeah. So, so going, you know, in high school, is it, is, is uh, I mean, you've been in, in the States long enough to understand to see how athletics are in high school in the U.S. How was it in Australia for you as far as the tennis side of it? Was it, uh, was it offered at school? Or was it something that you had to leave school and go do? How, you know, how was that, how was that brought to you? Yeah, it was not offered to me at school. It's very different. <clears throat> it's a very different <laughs> growing up in Australia in some respects, because sports is after school um, kind of thing. But there are schools, obviously, that offer things now, sort of private schools as well. Um, in particular, I didn't really have that. I went to an all girls Catholic school. It wasn't, you know, so we weren't we weren't going off and doing things of the day. We were at school. We were doing our, mm-hmm. uh, you know, education from nine till three, and then after that, we were off to do our own thing. So um, it's a little bit different to, I guess, the US, where they have a lot of um, schedule program. But I also have friends that have kids in private schools in in Australia that have days where in the morning they do water polo or they have swimming or they have uh, tennis or whatever it is, they go and do that. And it's allotted into their educational education time. Um, But, you know, Australia is so obsessed with sports that you cannot avoid it. Uh, You cannot avoid wanting to do it. And I think that that is, you know, I'm I'm very blessed um, to have had that as a kid that I, I just, I just wanted to do anything I could to be outside and be around my friends. And I think that's also an important thing for parents is that, you know, you, when you're having an organized sport and, you know, Kevin, you know what this is like when you have organized sports, you're around your friends, you feel like you've got a coach, you've got people around you, mentoring you and helping you. And, um, and I I find that a lot of CEOs, if they're employing someone, they want to know if they played an organized sport as a kid, because it really does matter. And because you, you learn discipline, you learn the highs, the lows, the wins, the losses, how do you deal with disappointment, all those things. So, I think playing sports as a kid is a, is a precursor to being having a lot of success in life. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, uh, you know, it, like you said, it teaches that teamwork and the, the building, but, but tennis is very individualized as well. Yeah. So, I mean, so it, a lot of it, so the, you know, the pressures that come along with, with that just on the individualistic side of the sport, you know, can, can help too, but it also kind of helps build the team, uh, you know, and help later on in your career playing doubles and everything else. Yeah. So, you know, being in high school and, and the, going and understanding, like, you know, like just talking about the U S sports high school, okay. Get a chance to get a college scholarship is it so in high school senior high school you want to go play tennis how how does it work in australia with that yeah it's interesting because i think if i'd known there was maybe an option to uh play college tennis i probably would have i may have gone that route because i knew that i would have been good enough to at least get a scholarship but i didn't really know about that Uh, it's it's a little bit more prevalent now people sort of know that that's that's an option if you're growing up in australia but I just finished a high school. But the thing with me was is that I, I was at the Australian Institute of Sport for the, from the age of 15 and a half, almost 16. So I spent four – well, 15. So I spent four years um, – I had a four-year scholarship to that. So that was the elite athletes in every single sport in Australia. 
were uh, given scholarships to go there. So we're talking everything from track and field, uh, weightlifting, netball, uh, basketball, uh, all the Olympic sports, um, mm-hmm. you know, so swimmers. Well, I was surrounded by all the best athletes, basketball players. So I was surrounded by the absolute elite of elite athletes from the age of basically 16, 17, 18, 17 and 18. Um, so I was sort of, that was my precursor into, oh, you're supposed to be destined to be one of our best tennis players because we have plucked you from sort of this obscurity to come here and and do that. And so that that gave me the, the impotence to think, oh, maybe I am a little bit special in my sport, in my country, and maybe I can take this further. Because as you know, you don't, as a 16 year old think, Oh, I'm going to be the best. This I'm going to conquer the world. You just like, Oh, cool. I get to do this more. Oh, cool. Um, I'm getting into, for you getting into sort of elite bas- uh, baseball teams. And I was in elite tennis teams. Maybe I took a travel to Italy, you know, cause they took us away for six weeks and we got an opportunity to go away and my, and the government in my case at the Australian Institute of Sport would pay for that. So, so I was kind of just, I just sort of went, I don't even know how to describe it. I just, that was my path. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I'm playing competitive tennis and I'm trying to get my ranking up and I'm making money. And so in Australia, I started making money when I was like 17, winning sort of small money tournaments. Um, So in the States, you have to declare amateur to go to college. So it's a little bit different that way. I wasn't really given that option. So I don't know. I guess it was just destiny for me once I got that scholarship to the Australian Institute of Sport it was someone saying to me, we think you're good enough to be a professional. Yeah. That, I mean, that, talk about a lot of pressure. And I am 16 years old, and here you are, right, plucked from – I mean, when you were in high school, did you even think about I, I, being an Olympic sport of just wanting to go play? And here they calling on you, hey, we want you to come be here. You know, talk about some of the pressure that that put on. I mean, 16-year-old kid, that is a lot of pressure, you know, representing your country, being one of yeah. however many tennis players, but then all of a sudden you're around all of them and that pressure. Talk about that a little bit, because that I mean that's because I don't think people understand what that really amounts to, especially at an Olympic level. Well, thank God, Kevin, at that age, I was too stupid to know what pressure really was. <laughs> right. And I was too young. I think my my feeling when I got that opportunity was, yes, cool. I get, I, get, I get to keep doing this, you know. I get to do this sport that I think I'm pretty decent at um, and they think I'm, I must be pretty decent at because, I mean, every year at that, you know, this was then, this doesn't has happen as much now, but at that point, you know, you're sort of like, okay, it's my turn. I am this age. Are they going to choose me to go to this program? So, and you don't. You can't like at college, you know, write letters and be like, Hey, yep. can I go here? Can I, can I get in there? It's just like, well, I hope they see me. I hope they pick me. And I was one of the best juniors. So I kind of in, thought that I, sh- I will go or I should go, but Hey, maybe they decide, Oh no, we like Sally better than you. We think she's got more talent or whatever it is, or she works harder or she's not quite as a nutbag as you, whatever the reason. <laughs> but they, when my time came for my opportunity mm-hmm. to get there, they picked me. So I was like, okay, this is cool. Uh, this is fun. I get to hang out with my friends and I get to go and play tennis and oh yeah, the school thing. And so it was, I was just, um, I didn't see it as pressure. I saw it as an opportunity. And I guess that's what the ones that want to do this for a living and understand the ramifications of that. They don't think about pressure. They just think about, yes, this is cool. How far did you grow up? Was the school from where you grew up? I mean, being away from home is, especially at sixteen, being away overnight at six. Like you said, you're you're sixteen. You don't know any different. But how far? I mean, were you able? Was it close enough to home, or was it something that where, you know, your parents had to fly and come see you? No, thank God, um, it was far enough away that my parents couldn't get in their car and drive there easily, um, but it was close enough that I could drive home. So it was about a three and a half. A dry, hour drive for me back to Sydney, and I used to do that quite mm-hmm. often. When once I was old enough to get my own uh, license, and my dad bought me a secondhand car, um, a Ford Laser for five thousand dollars. I'll never forget <laughs> it. Um, you know, but I thought that was like, hey, I thought that was like a Ferrari. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> um, I had independence, so at like seventeen, basically, I could drive home of a weekend. Um, so I used to drive home on a Friday night sometimes, um, and I had another friend of mine who was from 
Sydney who had a car and we would like caravan back together. Um, and so I would go home every now and again, not all the time, just maybe once every three, four weeks, I would drive home just to see my parents, see my friends in Sydney. So it was far enough away that it wasn't easy for me to go home, but it was close enough that if I really put some effort in, I could drive home. Um, and I think about that now and I'm like, oh my God, I used to drive home at like 10 o'clock at night. It's kind of crazy what I used to do, but I had such independence as a kid and that actually helped me navigate the next 20 years of my life of being out there in the world stage by myself, making a life for myself. So, so that, that was, it was good for me to be close, but not too close. Yeah. The, so this is, this was just athletic purely, no education yes. other than the education of your sport. No, no, no. So we, this wasn't like a college or was it? No, we had, we, it was a, it was a, where I was living was, if you can imagine, it's kind of like a big Olympic, um, uh, training area. So we were living in dorms. So it felt like a college, um, with sports. And then yeah. we used, so I used to play tennis in the morning very early, like, you know, six thirty till you know, eight thirty, and then we would go to school at a regular school okay. in the in the area that was kind of catered to uh, the the Institute of Sport athletes. All of the athletes who are under a certain age went to that school in the area, um, so they'd kind of done a, a trade with them and said, you know, take care of our athletes. Um, I did my schooling instead of over two years from eleventh and twelfth year, so my last two years of college. Uh, high school were done over three years. So they allowed us okay. to not, we didn't have to be at school from nine to five because we couldn't. Um, so they gave yeah. us the opportunity to do the last two years of our college base uh, of high school over three years. And that's what I did. I did my last two years of high school over, over three years and it was great. So we were around normal people, normal kids as well, which was important to have that social yeah. friendships outside of sports etc. So, um, I, it was, it was kind of a great thing. And then my last year there was, I was not at school. I was just purely, that's when I was really focused on, all right, I'm going to be a pro. That, and that was how old were you at that point? I was 19. Yeah. 19. So this is, so this would have been, what year would that have been? Oh, do you, you, you can remember age me, man. Um, it's, I was, it was like 87, 88, that period okay. of time. Um, yeah, okay. 89. So, 89 was my first sort of real foray into professional tennis all year. Okay. So, so going through this pro this whole process of where you are, right. Being the Olympics being the ultimate goal at, at that age. So, you know, so what, what kind of, so you, once you're done at the Academy or you had to be out after so many years yeah, they're like, and then See you, you go later. into prof- they're like, we're not paying for us it. anymore. Get, get, get lost. Go, go by. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that's why my last year of being there on scholarship, um, I knew that I had to make a mark in the world rankings and, I, that's what I did. So in the last year I spent, I spent six months of my, my, my scholarship of being in Canberra away. I, I literally traveled everywhere and that was paid by me. I, my dad gave me, oh, really? my dad gave me a credit card. Um, actually they didn't want to send me, they sort of refused to send me cause they said my, my results at home hadn't really warranted me, you know, getting a trip paid for by them. And so I said, and that was the, that was the moment that, I became me because I said, well, that's great, but I'm going to go anyway and I'm paying my own way. And they were like, okay, well, that's up to you. And I sort of left. Um, and, and I never, I never went back and I never looked back. And my dad, you know, gave me a credit card and said, look, you know, what? here's, here's an opportunity, go for it. And I went away and I played some money tournaments in the U S. Um, and I made enough money to pay my dad back on my credit card. And I haven't owed a dollar to anybody since. And so that was, that was a big moment for me because I, I could have, I could have reverted and retreated back into a hole and been like, well, people don't believe in me, so I guess I'm not good enough. And some girls do that, sadly. Um, but me, I was I was not flight. I was fight. So I was like, all right, yeah. then F you. I'm out of here. I'm going to do it on my own. And I did, and I never looked back. And within four or five years, I bought a home in the U.S., and I'd made enough money to do that. And and that was that was it. And you just and you talk about that that mental side of it, right? Of of where you know what athletes go through. Of you know you're not you can't do this. You're you you know you you don't have what it takes. And you're like me. You have that use that. That's fuel yeah. for the fire of saying you know what I'm going to prove every one of you wrong. Yeah. And that's the that's motivation itself. In this generation nowadays, that there's no motivation to do it, 
right? Maybe they need to start putting them in these in these hole with the with the least amount of amenities that they can have and figure out, all right, I'm stuck with all the how do I get away from this? What do I need to do? Right. This generation doesn't, they seem to not want to ask that question of how they, of, you know, how did you do it? They want to just, just, just tell me. And then, and then it automatically happens. Right. Oh yeah. I mean, look, there's, you know, there's some that make it big quick and they're just the freaks, right. The LeBron Jameses, the, you know, in your sport, Aaron judges that just are like, you know, they're just going to be special, right? You know, the Alex Rodriguez, the Derek Jeters. I mean, they, they come along oh, oh so often, right? Not, they're not, they're not, they're lightning in a bottle, right? So like mm-hmm. with me for t- in tennis, for example, like back in my day, like Steffi Graf was a phenom, Monica Sellis, a phenom, Ma- Martina Hingis, phenom, like, but those are rare, right? Serena, Venus, um, there's so many that you don't know about that grind away at the lower level, like and play in shitty tournaments in, in Europe or <laughs> in, in the U S and where they're calling their own lines and picking up their own balls and getting maybe 50 points at a tournament. You're like, oh, I just moved 10 spots in the ranking and I'm so close to qualifying at a bigger tournament. And so that is a constant grind. There's so thousands, just like in baseball thousands and thousands of kids trying to make it so if you want to distinguish yourself amongst them you better work harder you better deal with disappointment better you better dig yourself out of a hole quicker there's so many things that you need to just be better than everybody else in because there is thousands of you doing the same thing all over the world and in particularly in tennis it is every country you know and in the u.s you're dealing with you know in baseball you're dealing with thousands of kids that are trying to do what you're doing who are super talented so if you don't work harder and be better and you know not have an attitude you're going to be left behind um and Mm -hmm. in my case i just i love the sport i love traveling i was very independent and i just kept going i just put my head down and kept going and you know I, i dealt with a lot of adversity and you know being from australia we were on the road six months of the year sometimes i mean which is brutal being away from friends and family. And I just knew the only way for me to be successful is that's what I had to do. So, so growing, you know, getting ready to this process of leaving school, um, you know, the tennis, so the tennis, Australian tennis player, correct. Rod Laver was one. Is that, is he yeah. correct? Rod Laver and yeah. was Martina Navratilova as well? No, Martina, was, she... she was Czech. Um, and then, okay. and then became an American citizen. Um, but okay. you know, who was like, a was... big female tennis player? from Australia that you kind of looked up to? Oh, wow. We had like, you know, of course, Margaret Court was, a, you know, way, 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 way ago. And then, uh, you know, Yvonne Gulligan Cawley was somebody that I looked up to um, a, a lot. Um, there was a player called Wendy Turnbull that was before me. And there was there was absolutely players before me that I looked up to. Um, none that were like mega superstars. I, I think Yvonne Gulligan Cawley in my age was probably the person that I was looking up to as a 10, 11 year old winning Wimbledon. I was like, wow, that's cool. Um, so no, it was, it was more along the lines of, and, and I, and Pat Cash, you know, won Wimbledon when I was like 16 and he was like, that was the moment where I was like, oh my God, an Australian just won Wimbledon, you know, that I understood. Um, and that was at a very pivotal time in my tennis career because I was, I was young enough, but old enough and good enough at that point to think, Hey, could I do something like that? Um, and I practiced with this girl called uh, Liz Smiley, Elizabeth Smiley, and she won the doubles at Wimbledon when I was about 18. And I used to practice with her quite a bit. She took me under her wing a little bit. I stayed with her in the States. It was kind of one of the reasons I moved to the U S when I moved to Orlando, um, because she had a home there and her and her husband sort of took me under their wing. So yeah, there's absolutely people older than me from Australia that really made a difference in my life. Um, and also made the difference for me transitioning over to the U.S. to live, um, to make a go of it as a as a player. So, yeah, I mean, it is really important to have mentors and people that you respect and love that are a little bit older than you helping you through that and navigate. Because for Australians, it is really quite difficult because we don't get a lot of competition down in Australia as well. It's so far to go. You know, in Europe and in Europe in particular, there's so many small tennis tournaments that you can travel to i mean bloody hell you can live in one country and be in another in two hours you know what i mean on a train yeah so that's not how it happens in australia you gotta leave the country if you want to be successful yeah that's yeah you gotta go around airs rock correct if you want to go to the other side yeah (laughs) Yeah. it's it's a big country but there's not a lot of tennis tournaments there because you know the itf the smaller tournaments don't have a lot of tournaments there so for you to get a ranking you really got to leave the country 
and then and then dealing with that. So, you know, so getting ready to, to branch out, like you said, to leave the conversations you had of people saying, you know, being prepared mentally, and you talk about that. So so you just you pick up and you just you just go. Yeah. Right. And then do you have a do you have an agent at this time or uh, is this or more right. agents even? Pack your bag on your way, pick your own tournaments, get your travel, book your tickets, book your trains, book your you know, whatever it does, buses. Um, and, you know, hopefully get one or two of your mates, um, on the road with you and you're sort of doing this all together. Um, and yeah, that's how it was. It was just the grind. It was a grind of small tournaments and trying to make it. And thankfully, you know, we're a bit of a traveling circus, um, the tennis tour. So whatever level you're at, you sort of get your little group around you, where there be five or six or seven of your friends and you kind of just try and make it. And then you may have to play against them, which is never fun because it is a one-on-one sport. Um, or in even in doubles, two on two. Um, so, so yeah, it's an interesting little crazy circus that we have on the tennis tour. So, you, I mean, you talk about growing up quick, right? You're 19, and here you go, and you're, and you're gone. Yeah, and you're just traveling all around, and end up end up in the U.S. playing, you know, playing the singles. When did you start doing the doubles side of it? Well, I mean, I always played doubles. So, you know, as a kid, you're always you're playing singles and doubles, and um, yeah. And I played singles up until I was 30 and then I retired from singles because I was getting a lot of injuries and, um, you know, it's the only regret of my career really, um, my tennis career is I didn't have the success in singles that I wanted. I mean, I was quite a good singles player. I was top 70 in the world, which is really hard to do considering there's millions of kids trying to make it there. Um, so I was proud of my my attempts in singles, um, but, you know, sadly I had a pretty bad wrist injury and things that kind of got in the way. But doubles came so naturally and easy to me that um, – I was just always very successful at that from a, from an early age. Uh, I won my first WTA tournament at 2020, I think, uh, 21, uh, 1992 was the first time I won a WTA tournament. I won four that year. So I was immediately like at 21 years of age, making money and winning tournaments. Um, at, because it just, it came, became, it came a lot more natural to me. And as I said before, with the, you know, Liz Smiley, the girl from Australia sort of took me under her wing um, she won Wimbledon and I would practice with her and I was like, wait, I'm practicing with her. I think I'm good enough. I think I'm as good as her in different ways. I know I've got a lot to learn, but I thought, oh, maybe, maybe she can win Wimbledon. Maybe I can win Wimbledon one day, which was such a foreign thing to think about, you know, as a kid, like you dream about yeah. it. But then when you're actually, but, I mean, you know what it's like, it's like you dream yeah. about being that person up at bat and like, am I the one that's going to win the world series for us? You know what I mean? And you think about it, but then when you actually have, you're actually there, you're like, oh shit, this is like my dream. It's actually happening. You don't, man- you manifest it, but you don't know it's going to happen. So I just was always very confident with my doubles. And I started focusing on that at 30 when I retired from singles and I put all of my efforts into just being a really great doubles player. And that was when I had, I had a lot of success before that, but that's when I had my major success, um, successes, winning majors and becoming number one in the world and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no set, game plan you don't have a set okay uh, in this year i'm gonna do this and then i'm gonna do that Mm -hmm. it just it just happens and you get lucky with the person that you play doubles with and you finally gel with somebody as i did with lisa raymond for example and then everything just goes the way it's supposed to so that's how so so picking a doubles partner you talk about with lisa and everything else is it kind of like tag team wrestling where you just go can you really go pick anybody that you really want to just say hey what what are your thoughts on this you know it's yeah, it's it's a very, that's all it is. It's it's a it's a it's it's kind of like Bumble uh, without uh, the the app. You know, you just kind of yeah. like, hey, um, you know, it, it, in, in Lisa and I's respect, uh, I always knew that she was a really great doubles player. For example, I'd had a lot of success with other players up until then. I'd won probably mm-hmm. at least ten WT tournaments on my own with other people: Lauren McNeil, Helena Sakova, all really good doubles and and great singles players. And then I play. I think I. I, I knew Lisa as a player. I knew how good good she was. She was played very similarly to me, serve and volley, great volleys, great serve. She was just a really, really, a really great tennis player. And I thought that we would do really well in doubles. I just knew that we were going to be really hard to beat if we were both at our best on a doubles court. And so we just sort of started talking about it. Um, she was playing with somebody randomly and her focus was really on singles at that time as well. She was a terrific singles player, made it into the top 15 in the world in singles. Um, so her focus was on that. But so when I sort of 
went to her and said, do you want to play this week? She was like, yeah, okay. And we made the finals of that first tournament that we played. And then I said, hey, do you want to play a full schedule next year together? Um, because some some singles players now play randomly with people and don't really care about manifesting a doubles team. And then there's people that really want to manifest a doubles team and do really well in doubles. And that was, you know, in the end what Lisa and I chose to do. And even when we were doing really well in doubles, she was doing really well in singles as well. So there was a lot on her plate, but that's just the way it worked. And we gelled immediately. We made, as I said, a final. And then as soon as we started playing together, we just started winning tournaments. And it was just like, okay, we should keep doing this. And we did it for, you know, six or seven years together. And we won 33 tournaments and three grand slams and, and it just worked out. Um, and, but you may play with somebody and you don't really like their personality. Your tennis doesn't really gel together. It's kind of like a relationship. It just doesn't work. And you say, Hey, listen, I think we're better off without each other. I think we can do better with somebody else. And also in tennis, you have to understand it's kind of like in baseball positions, right? Just because Mm -hmm. you play outfield doesn't necessarily mean you're a great going to be a great first baseman or you you know you could be a a shortstop or a catcher you're not going to be a great second you know what i mean so you're good enough you could play those positions i'm sure and you do as a kid but in when you're a pro you know what your strengths and weaknesses are and so for me for example i had a really i had a good backhand my inside out forehand was probably my better return lisa's best forehand was her forehand cross court so then you start going okay, you're definitely a forehand court player and I'm definitely a backhand court player. So that also matters in doubles. Your strengths and weaknesses of what you do um, in your game also yeah. um, make a difference of who you should play doubles with, for example. So there were some people that I would have liked to have played with, but they were more a backhand side player, which is what I was. So that also matters as well in doubles. Yeah. You talk about the, the your what what benefits you your your strengths and weaknesses and then under that camaraderie you build of knowing where you don't even have to think you know that she's going to be in a certain spot right and and doing this so you guys built this this great camaraderie and and started winning tournaments so leading so you go to what's going up into your first olympics correct was it 96 yeah my uh, 96 was my first olympics but you know with, with in tennis um the focus is on our, on grand slams right and yeah oh yeah and then and then the Olympics started to become a conversation when I was like, you know, starting to play as well. But that's, as you know, once every four years. So our focus is only on Grand Slams and our ranking and winning WTA tournaments. And then once the Olympics starts coming around, then you start thinking about it because then it started to become part of it. And it was the one, the one thing I didn't win was a medal at the Olympics, which still to this day pisses me off um, but because <laughs> I played four of them, you know. Um, but the first one in 96 in Atlanta, I actually got sick um, and I didn't actually get to play. Um, I got sick on the day of my match, so I actually had to pull out. And it was my best opportunity probably to win a medal that was that year because of the fact that I was playing doubles with Lisa, for example. But at the Olympics, you have to play with another Australian. Yeah, that's I what I was just going to ask. How do you pick that? That is chosen for you based on your the ranking. So if I'm, you know, at that point at 96, I was probably I was three or four in the world in doubles, and then they had pitted me with um, a girl called Nicole Bradkey, who was the number one singles player, but was also ranked, you know, fairly high in doubles. But we were also we played a bit together um, at Billie Jean King Cup, which is the female equivalent of Davis Cup, and so we had played okay. a couple of competitive matches in that, and we were quite good. Um, so I felt really comfortable going in and playing with her because we'd actually played a bunch of really high profile matches together. Um, but that didn't happen every time at the Olympics for me. It was just kind of, all right, here's your other Aussie, you play together, make it work. And it wasn't that easy because it's not easy to gel. Um, it's kind of like a basketball team. You could have the best players in the world, but if they haven't played together, no one knew, knows who's throwing it to who, what position are you going to, where do you like to shoot from, all that sort of stuff. That's just like throwing it together in a, in a millisecond was not easy. But the 96 Atlanta, uh, the 96 Atlanta Olympics was probably my best chance to win a medal. And sadly, I got sick. So, yeah, I, I still haven't forgotten about that. <laughs> so doing that, I mean, think about it. So did they give you what? Um, so no, so knowing – do you have do you have to qualify for that Olympic double? So go, no, going into the two, so going to two thousand Olympics, which were in Sydney, right? Of saying okay, when, when do they let you know who your doubles partner is going to be? Do they give you f- some time, or is it just well, you you here? you kind of have a bit of a say at that point in two thousand. For example, I was number one in the world, 
So I kind of had a little bit of a say on, um, you know, I'd maybe hope to play, but really it's based on who they think would be the best team, like our coaches and managers and the rankings. So if another Australian was ranked 18 in the world in doubles and she was the next top one, we were going to play together. And that was just the way it was. Um, so it's based on rankings, um, who you play with at the Olympics. Um, and that's just the way it goes. Now, if you had four players that were similar rankings, for example, and one liked someone a little bit better or felt like they could gel better together, or the coaches felt like, for example, I'm a, I like to play on the back end. If the next highest player was also a back end side player, they would probably say, well, you guys aren't going to do that well because somebody has to play the forehand side. Um, and you know, Sally is ranked a couple of ranking spots behind the higher one, but she's a forehand court player. You guys will gel better together. So that also makes a difference. It, it just, it honestly, it's just based on solely on rankings, uh, who gets picked into the Olympic team. It is all about the ranking. So, so you don't have, I mean, how much time would you have to get, actually get a chance to gel with this? Would it just be, Hey, Olympics are in six months. This is who your partner is going to be. I mean, would you have time? I mean, you've got four years in between the Olympics, right? So being able to oh, you would know, have no idea because they don't pick oh, really? the team. They don't pick the team until about six months before the Olympics. So, oh, geez. So, so you're really trying to your, your crunch time. You've got to figure this out. And on top of the pressure of trying to win a gold medal yeah. in your home country, on, on probably a courts that you know about, and here you are, you've got six months to figure this out. Well, in, on that occasion in Sydney um, 2000, because I really wanted to do well, and I, I, I was number one in the world, and I was in the middle of you know a two-year swing there, 2000, well, 99, 2000, 2001, and two, where I was like one of the best doubles players, just winning everything, um, you know, Grand Slams, tournaments, number one in the world. Like I was one of the more dom- most dominant players in that in my field for those four mm-hmm. or five years. So. Um, it was in that occasion I was playing with a player that I had never played with. Uh, I played one match at Billie Jean King Cup and I said, okay, you know what? I really want to do well. And she was an um, amazing singles player as well, um, top five in the world. So I thought we could do well. And she was a very good doubles player. So I said, why don't we play one tournament together prior to the Olympics, which is what we did. Sadly, we lost first round against a really good team. But we made, I made, we made an effort to try and play a tournament before the Olympics because you do have to have a bit of – you have to play together. And, you know, yeah. Kevin, honestly, I've also had lightning in a bottle where I've played with a player. I played with my first ever Grand Slam that I made. I played with a player um, and we made the final. Like that's rare, though, that you play just a pickup partner and you make a yeah. final uh, of something as big as the U.S. Open. Um, but that does happen. Um, that can happen. But that's also about personality. What's, you know, it's, it, it does – yeah. Doubles is, as you know, you can put the, together a great team. Doesn't mean you're going to be great. Yeah. So, so you talk about you know wanting to represent your country through. You played in four Olympics. Yeah. Doing that, and then, but you also talk about the um, winning Wimbledon. Yeah. Right. The U.S. Open yeah. and the Australian Open. Correct. Yeah. What doubles? Yeah. Of of all those of you know of being that what which one meant the most? I mean, was it winning the Australian Open on your home soil? Was it was it Wimbledon because it's the biggest? I mean, there's a lot that you know, like you said, trying to do that, trying to balance that, trying to balance the Olympics. I mean, it almost seems like you had zero time for yourself to do this, <laughs> right, with this pressure and everything else. You know, um, it's kind of like you know when. You, trying to pick a favorite kid. You kind of have one. Yeah. You kind of have one, yeah. but you can't really say it. Um, but, I mean, I honestly, <laughs> I have different feelings for my Grand Slam victories. You know, obviously winning my first Grand Slam at the Australian Open was just a, a, a feeling that I could not describe. I mean, it'd be, it's like winning uh, a World Series. It's just it's something you dream about. It happens and you just can't believe it. And obviously it happened in Australia and my family never traveled to watch me play once in a blue moon. Like literally my parents saw me play once at Wimbledon. Um, is that winning in front of my family who were there, not all of them were there, but most of them were there and it was absolutely packed and clearly it was in Australia. So I had such terrific support, particularly right at the end of the match. Um, that, is a moment I'll never forget as long as I live. It was just, it, I got goosebumps right now, just sitting here listening yeah, to I you mean, talk about a, this just because of what, it, yeah, I was a blubbering mess, you know, at the trophy ceremony. <laughs> and I just, I couldn't believe that I achieved something that I just, I always dreamed about, but never quite wasn't quite sure if I could do. Um, and then when it happens, you're like, my God. And I served the match out, which, you know, it was on my racket kind of thing. It was kind of like, I was the closer coming in and I did it, you know? Yeah. And 
And then, um, so that was a special beyond words that I can't describe. But then, you know, when I had the opportunity the night before to win Wimbledon and Lisa and I said to each other and Lisa said to me, oh my God, we could be Wimbledon champions tomorrow. That is just a foreign word to me. Wimbledon champion? Like what? Because you said it is revered so much in our world and even for the layman that don't really follow tennis, everybody knows. Yeah, you hear that Wimbledon, name. you won Wimbledon? Like they don't care yeah. if I won all these other things. So like you won Wimbledon? So it's like, yeah, and I, I had the benefit of winning it twice, which is even, you know, cooler. But that is a moment that I'm just like, oh, my God, I can't believe that I'm going to be on the walls of this place. I'm going to have tickets for the rest of my life. Like I'm last, like all the things that make Wimbledon so special. So they were two very different feelings. Um, and then, you know, and then when I won it for the second time, I didn't win it with Lisa. I won it with another player, Cara Black, and it was her first Grand Slam. And she went on to win like 10 or 11 more Grand Slams. So I was happy that I was the first to do it with her. Um, and that meant so yeah. much to me that I was able to help her win her first Grand Slam. And then when we won the US Open, that was another different feeling because I knew how much that meant to Lisa as an American because she yeah. had done it and helped me win in Australia. And she knew how much that meant to me to win in Australia. And then so when she won this US Open, I'll just, Lisa was not really into like all the glitz and the glam and the, praise and all, but I know how much it meant to her to win that tournament. So that was also just made us feel like we really had achieved something so incredible of uh, winning the amount of times we had at Grand Slam level and for her to get a US Open under her belt um, and for me to help her do that. So there was all very different feelings um, winning all those different Grand Slams, but they all, they're all special in their own way. And But that Wimbledon title feels pretty damn good. <laughs> Yeah, I, and you're right there. That's because we're getting close, right? The next couple of yeah. weeks is it June? Yeah. Is that yeah. right? So you'll be, so you know, you know, you finish, you know, you, you retire from from tennis of you know with this with everything that you've been through, right? Going in, now going into commentating and you know doing shows and everything else. What have you noticed that has changed from when you were 16 years old to what you see now? As far as from from tennis itself, is it has it. It, like you know, we talk about baseball. How much analytics have destroyed baseball, right? Through the, it's a one sport baseball that it can take it can take over tennis. What what do you say? Has there been a lot of change as far as the game itself, or is or is it just kind of stayed steady? But it's the numbers are increasing. Um, I think you know, as far as analytics concerned in tennis, it, yeah, we get all the analytics as well, and you can analyze uh, a player to death and know their strengths and weaknesses, etc. But it's, it's this thing called the eye, <laughs> and as you know, mm -hmm. same in baseball, um, I can st I still get more from watching a match and being able to pick apart um, a strength and weakness of a player than I do looking at analytics. Now, if I put the analytics towards what I see, then I then that makes me go, oh, okay, I was right. Um, but as far as the tennis, it's just so good now. I mean, honestly, like I cannot believe the – I sit and watch players now in some matches and I just my, – my jaw is on the ground, how good these people can play the game of tennis, the amount of rallies that they can play back to back to back, the physicality of the game, the, the, the variety of the game. Um, it's just unbelievable to me. I just – honestly, I'm in awe. I'm a fan um, I, I, I don't sit back and go, well, in my day, we wouldn't have missed that shot. Oh, in my, <laughs> the, only, the only thing I will say is in my day, we would have made a way better volley on that because some of these players cannot volley. That is the one thing about tennis. Um, not so much, I guess, in the men's, they're still sort of decent, but mm, there's a lot that they can't volley for absolute mm, at all. They're terrible. So they don't develop their volley game as much as they should and that's because the ground strokes are so big now and they play from the back of the court unbelievably you know and back 30 years ago people couldn't rally like that they weren't as good on the baseline but they were hell of a volleyer they'd come into the net like crazy you know i yeah. think about someone like a stefan edberg who had the kind of the most average forehand but my god that dude could volley and he was so athletic and people like pat rafter i mean pat rafter his baseline game he would get chopped now against the alcaraz or a Djokovic, but he would out volley those guys and he would get into the net and he would finish points off. So I guess the only thing about tennis is yes, it's, it's the physicality and the rallies and the way these guys play with the strings now and the technology being a little bit better. I could honestly say the only part of the game that is 
it has gone down is the volleying part of the game. But when you look at someone like a Carlos Alcaraz, this new number one male player, he can do it all. He can come into the net. He can volley. He's got all the skills. He's kind of like a Roger Federer um, as far as being able to play from all over the court. Um, but honestly, Kevin, what I see now after 20, 30, 40 years of seeing it is just how good everyone is. Yeah, the athletic ability yeah. and stuff. So you talk about the the volley. That is, is that a, I don't know anything about tennis other than yeah. just watch. But is that a, that's a fundamental yeah. concept of tennis. So, so it, but it, so it, what it's it sounds like it's the same thing though with, with tennis baseball. The fundamentals of but baseball are gone. Learning to run bases, how to slide. Yeah. You would think this they would understand the volley because you know you talk about this new number one yeah. of being an old school type of player of where, okay, you know, if they're going to the volley, they're going to be able to do this because they don't, other people don't know how to, def, how to defend it. I mean, so is yeah. it, well, that's, think, that's what I see. And that's what it sounds like. I'd explain it. Like, um, you know, the volley is where you finish it at the net, right? So you come in and yeah. you just finish yeah. it off at the net. Right. So, so if, if you hit a really great ground stroke, if like back 20 years ago, if you had a great ground stroke, you could run into the net and just boom, finish the volley off. Right. And finish the point off quickly. There's a little bit of trepidation to run into the net now because everyone is so athletic and their ground strokes are so good that if you don't come in on something good, you're done. You're going to get passed. They're going yeah. to get the ball around you and you have no chance or they'll hit a shot that's so good that you have to have the most incredible volley to win the point. So there is a reason why people don't come into the net and finish the point off at the net anymore is because everyone's so bloody good from the back of the court and so athletic and strong. Um, so... So that's the difference, uh, you know, and I've got tennis on in the background all the time and I'm watching this guy just hit a terrible volley, for example, to lose the point. You know, so, but if you can fundamentally work on that volley as a kid, it will help you so much because I see someone hit a great shot, their opponent is completely on the run, completely dead, really doesn't have a chance to hit a great shot past you and they don't come into the net. And then the, and the point gets reset and then they start the rally again. And I'm like, oh, my God, if you just ran into the net behind that and actually could hit a volley and were good as a volleyer and understood how to transition into the net, you would have won that point. And then instead yeah. he might win it or she might win it 17 balls later because they've now reset the yeah. point and played another federal baseline. But if you had just trusted yourself to go into the net, you would have won the point. So there's little bits of there's a reason why they don't go into the net. But also at the same time, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be working on it as a kid to get it yeah. and have the opportunity or the availability of a volley that's good. Is that what you see in these these top the top tier tennis players, male or female, of having the, that ability? Yes, for, for, you know, being able to. Okay, so that's what separates. So it is. It but it almost seems like it's an old school mentality. You just see that because it's. It's like a trick, a trick of the trade type of thing where you would, you know, a long stroke, a ground stroke, but then they're going to play it and then they play the soft stuff because they're so afraid of a great, of a great, you know, forehand or a stroke and, and they're just playing it just over the net. And it, do you see that? Is that what separates really those top players from everybody else? Certainly. Um, look, you know, you don't have to, you, you can be a, t look, Serena Williams, a perfect example. Serena will be the first for me, if I said her volleys were not good, okay, her back end volley in particular was average at best. Um, and we're talking about arguably the greatest player of all time. You're like, wait a second, she couldn't really volley? I said, yeah, because her serve was so good and her ground strokes were so good and her speed around the court was so good that she didn't need to have great volleys to win matches, you right? Gotcha. So in tennis, you don't need, you don't need to have good volleys at all to win. I mean, Iga Sviantek, who's number one in the world in singles right now, probably would rather run away from the net than actually be in at the net. Now, she knows that if she can add, and she knows this, if I can add a comfort level of when I do come in behind my massive ground strokes and I'm comfortable with hitting a volley, I know I'm going to be even more difficult to beat because ultimately yeah. if you do have the ability to come in behind those big ground strokes and you know how to play at the net, Rafa, Novak, Roger, Alcaraz, all the really great players over the last 10, 15 years in men's tennis, and there's a couple in women's tennis. If you finish Ash Barty, number one in the world, you know, who retired last year, she was great at the net. So she could finish off the great forehand and come in and just go bloop with a volley instead of having, because it's much harder to win the point from the baseline. If you're a good volleyer, yeah. it's easy. It's like bunting, right? 
you yeah. should be able to bunt. Small ball, right? It's basically small ball. Small ball. You, yeah. You, if you can yeah. bunt really, really well, oh man, does that add an extra thing to your right? So you line up to go hit that ball, and they're like, "Oh shit, is he going to bunt? He's a great bunter. We got to watch that." But if you're a terrible bunter, which happens, I'm sure, in baseball, and you have those scouting, yeah, you know, most of the time it's a fundamental that's gone. If you're a scout, yeah. if you're a scout, you're like, "Can't bunt. Don't worry about it." Right? Or you're like, yep. "Can bunt. Be careful." So that is an added layer layer to your toolbox repertoire, right? Yep. And in tennis, mm -hmm. it's exactly the same. So, shit, you better make sure that when you're running for that ball and they're coming in, you have to hit a great passing shot because this person is an amazing volleyer. But if you're playing somebody who you know is a terrible volleyer as a coach, yeah. I go, make yeah. her volley. Do not try and hit a winner, okay? So that is also fundamental to the game. And if you're a good volleyer, it does add to your toolbox. Yeah. You talk about the strength and the speed of the game and how hard these serves are nowadays, correct? But so, you know, real quick, just with the double side of the playing, right? Because doubles, you don't, do you play side by side or do you play staggered? It, it's all a combination. It, it can be staggered, okay. it can be right next to each other, it can be on the baseline, can be both at the net, um, can be one at the net, one in the baseline. There's all various variations of how you play. Um, doubles and what your strengths and weaknesses are and if you're a terrible volleyer you are going to be on the baseline all the time and ideally you want to play if you're a terrible volleyer it'd be great to play with somebody who's good at the net because that really does make uh you know that's good if you're yeah. good at everything that makes a big difference like my doubles partner lisa raymond one of the reasons why she was so successful in doubles and won like 80 tournaments on tour is because she was really good on the baseline and really good at the net and had a great serve so really she didn't have a lot of weaknesses and that's that's obviously a massive bonus. I was similar. I wasn't anywhere near as good as Lisa on the baseline. Um, but I could play from back there, but my money was made coming into the net. Okay. That's right. Just, I just wanted man, the speed of the ball of trying to charge the net and somebody just hey, hammering them. You hit it hard at me, oh, it's even better because my, my reflexes were probably the best thing that I had. And hmm. you, if you hit a ball hard at the net, it's actually a lot easier to hit. It's kind of like – a fastball is a lot easier to hit than, you know, something that's moving, yeah. right? It's exactly the same in tennis. If you hit something to me at the net, it's got a ton of spin. It's like, oh, God, i got to get my legs down. i got to control my racket head. The ball's going to hit it in a very awkward way. Whereas if you hit it flat and hard to me, that's easy. Yeah. Same. Do you miss, do you miss it? Do you um, miss being out there or I'm, do you understand it? I, I played 22 years professionally, so I think I – I think I ran my race, but yeah, of course there's times where I'm like, oh man, I miss that feeling so much, but I got it, I got it a little bit when I was coaching as well. Um, and that feeling of helping someone achieve something terrific yeah. and great. Um, yeah, of course, just like you, there are times where you're like, oh man, I miss that. But then again, I don't miss the grind. I don't miss the stress. I don't miss the not being able to eat in the morning. Cause I was so nervous about my match later on. And yeah. So, um, there's things it ages miss. us, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It ages, ages us. That all that stuff ages us and everything else. But you're right. You sit there and try and watch, and some of it is hard. Baseball is hard for me to watch. You know, I saw, I'll watch some tennis, you know, here and there, and and seeing all that. So, so now just you know, commentating and doing this stuff, traveling. You're still traveling, correct? Doing this stuff, commentating. Well, I travel very little now. This year in particular. Oh, really? I've got my. Well, I was traveling a lot last year, and. Um, every year prior to that. But this year I just took a job uh, this year starting last November uh, with Prime Video Sports. So I'm doing my own sports show every day um, from Monday to Friday um, at 5 o'clock live. So I'm you – know, And it's called the what? The Power Hour? Is that correct? called the Power Hour. So I'm in New York and I'm here every day, every week. I have a normal J-O-V. Um, so it's kind of like interesting for me that I'm in a place for the first time without – going, oh, God, I'm going to get on a plane in two days. Um, so it's kind of been nice. I'll see how I feel about it by the end of the year if I'm, like, getting antsy because I've been so nomadic my whole life. Um, but it is kind of nice to be in a place not needing to travel. But I still get my I still get my travel in because I went to Australia, obviously, for the Australian Open with ESPN, and I'm going to Wimbledon for ESPN. So I still get away and I still get to go, um, you know, see those places and be around my friends um, uh, still to this day. So it's nice. I, I have a good balance. Are you, are you covering the U, are you doing the U S open yeah. as well or no? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, okay. Yeah. So you're, 
Oh yeah, I'll be, okay. I'll be in the U.S. Open, but you know, I live in New York, so there's no travel. For me yeah, there. <laughs> which is good. Yeah. So, so yeah, doing that, so being able to, you know, doing something you love, and you know, you never thought of this as a kid, right? Playing professional tennis, being a commentator, yeah. and everything else. So, I mean, so you know, to this gener, this new generation of tennis players, you know, what advice did, could you give that you that you have taken from all this to tell this new generation? Well, I have on my arm tattooed the word passion. Um, because I just, I live by that mantra in life. Um, and if you don't have passion for whatever you're doing, and I mean, in anything, everything you're doing, whether it be, uh, the sport that you choose, the, the job that you choose, your, the partner that you choose, um, the friends that you choose, all of it, if you don't have passion for them, for it, um, you're probably not going to be happy and you're not going to be successful at it. So I think the thing that the only thing that I could pass on, everybody has their own journey to live. Um, and, and, but I would say, listen to your elders. If you're a kid and you're a young person coming through, particularly, um, the elders that have gone through what you want to go through, for example, like I really listened to my peers that were older than me that made such a difference. And you know, Kevin, what that's like, and you had, you know, a, a player that you looked up to and he said something to you that, Oh, you were like, Oh my God, that's like, bold, right? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, bank it, like put that in the bank and listen to them because they're, on, they're, they've gone through what you're about to go through and you're going to learn that lesson, but they're giving you the lesson. They're telling you, right. Whether it be whatever it is, you know, stop with the shitty attitude, um, you know, have a better, um, reaction to X. Um, maybe don't swing at that, you know, with tennis, it was, the same. I, I really, once I started listening to people that I really respected and trusted, it made a really big difference in my life. But, um, I would say have passion for what you do. That's the key and you will be successful at it. And success is not winning a world series or winning a grand slam. It's just being the best version of whatever you choose to do. Yeah. And that's, and you know, it's great advice, like you said, because, and each sport kind of helps us grow depending on, on when you had to grow up early from what yeah. you were taught. But, and that's something you've learned being able to, to pass on. So, yeah. um, you know, jumping on here and being able, so if people can follow you, are you on social media? I am. I'm on, uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter, um, at Renee Stubbs, uh, with two N's A E, um, and, uh, yeah, they can catch me over there. Uh, people find me a little entertaining on Twitter cause <clears throat> I'm fairly, um, outspoken on a lot of stuff. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, it is me. It, it is who I am. I should probably put the socials down sometimes, but, uh, I find it uh, fun to, to get involved, but yeah, you can find me on that. And of course, every weekday on the power hour on prime video sports and everybody has prime. So there's no excuse not to see it. Gotcha. Absolutely. I, yeah, I, I looked, I was following you yesterday. I got it on there just to see. So well, we I could have cool some good banter on going. I had my old doubles partner on, uh, Lisa Raymond, and I had Steve Nash on yesterday talking about uh, his new app that he's got going and uh, the NBA and all kinds and what his future is and sort of life lessons uh, as, a, as a coach and what he teaches his kids. So it was, it was fun. Uh, we'll have Jimmy Connors on in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm going to break down the French Open draw that's just come out today. today. So we've got a lot going on. So the next big one is what, Wimbledon? Uh, the next one is the French Open. It's coming up next week. Um, so oh, okay. the French Open without Rafael Nadal. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, going to be exciting. I, you know, I get very excited and jacked about the Grand Slam. So the draw literally came out about 20 minutes ago. So I'm going to go oh, look through perfect. it and uh, de decipher the draw down. And we get going next week. Well, Renee, I appreciate you jumping on and, and catching up. And like I said, we'll have, definitely have to follow up again to see how, you know, these next years of your life pan out yeah. and, you know, what you're doing to see if you're getting anxious and everything else. So, but I appreciate you jumping on and, um, you know, looking forward to, uh, to seeing, seeing where this journey goes and, uh, and, and tennis itself. So, Thanks, you know, I appreciate it all. And I appreciate yeah. it. Hey, I'm going to ask yeah, you a absolutely. question. Who's going to win the world series this year? Come on, give me one name. Oh, God. Don't beat around. I don't know. The Rangers here are playing well. Uh -huh. Your 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 Rays are playing well. It's you know it it's still early. Are there going to be some deadline moves? We, we we don't know. That's that's the thing. It's just it's one of those where you know it's still early. You you know where the this the, this whole thing is going to be decided in the dog days around August. 
there's that last six, eight weeks, right? When you're just, you see the end and you're like, ah, you're like gosh, uh, this is boy. that grind. This is what you're built for. That grind right there is what I think is going to separate these teams to see what happens. So that's right. It'll I, be interesting to say the least. I don't know. Like you said, my Rays are playing well, but, uh, you know, they started out on fire. They lost a game 20 to one the other day. So I don't know what happened there. But anyway, well, you saw, I guess you have bad days and you're the season for baseball so long that you sometimes you just go, you know what? I can't deal with this today. And I think they had that the other day, but uh, I don't know. I think the Dodgers, Rays, maybe. We'll see. We'll check in on this uh, come uh, October, my friend. 